I need to start by saying that I have no relation to the Peter Singer that was mentioned earlier, and so please don't drag my family name through the mud. Um, but the talks this morning set this talk up perfectly, and really what this issue about is about to me, at least from a policy perspective, is misinformation. So what I'm going to try to do today in this brief 20 to 25 minute session is explore what, is, what are some of the issues facing us, especially this PAMTA bill, and uh, where I think the misinformation is, um, is really having an impact. Try to tell you a little bit about how I view the science, a little bit about what, what worries me on this topic, and then we'll finish with that. I do apologize that I have to leave at the break for Chile, and so if any of you want to contact me later, I mean, this is basically the majority of my research program as well as policy, I'd be happy to talk to you later, either through email or phone call. Let's just start with what is an antibiotic, because this is, again, a major source of misinformation. An antibiotic is just simply some low molecular weight compound that inhibits or kills bacteria or any microorganism. And the key here, the part that seems to be forgotten, is that these originally were naturally produced by bacteria or fungi in the environment, period. We find them everywhere, naturally. We have now since taken some of those natural compounds, we've created synthetic analogs to them, and we use them as what we think of as higher, high-powered antibiotic. But the fact is that they were always present in the environment. Why? What are they doing there? The dogma has always been it's about germ warfare. It's how one organism is trying to kill out its competitors in the environment. And that is a piece of misinformation that I really want to focus on because it's that warfare mentality that has led us to a dogma about what type of antibiotic use is best, which has also then positioned us to potentially lose a whole variety of antibiotic uses. What seems to be the actual reason these, these compounds exist or are produced naturally is that they are signaling molecules. It seems that these bacteria in a community, in, this, in the environment, are interacting with each other and use these to indicate that there are changes to the environment and the whole bacterial community responds. The levels are so low, they're not killing each other with them. It seems that they are using it as a means of communication. Why is that important? Because it does relate to the kinds of uses we have for antibiotics and the uses that are being targeted, for instance, in this PAMTA bill that I'll talk about. In the United States, we have four primary approvals for antibiotic uses. One is in the growth promotion feed efficiency group or use, then comes disease prevention, then disease control, and disease treatment. The key here is that growth promotion is at a low dose over longer periods of time, usually administered through feeds. Disease prevention, slightly higher dose, either through food or water. Those two uses are definitely out in this bill that's coming before Congress. Possibly as well, the idea of disease control would be eliminated. Disease control means that some of your herd or flock is breaking with disease, but not everybody, so you start treating. You're then treating healthy animals, because not everybody is sick. Some of those uses would disappear under PAMTA. And finally, there's disease treatment, which basically means giving a sick animal with clinical signs a, uh, the antibiotic, <clears throat> something that we rarely see in production medicine. So this bill, the PAMTA, which has the House and Senate versions, would eliminate at least two to three of these currently approved uses. And uh, like was stated earlier by, by um, Representative Scott, it's definitely a bill we need to pay attention to because it is being discussed. And it would severely impact how we raise animals. So what I'm going to do is just use this schematic to show why we are being attacked for the ways which we use antibiotics, and it comes down to, again, this misinformation about what an antibiotic is. In 1913, we're talking you know, basically a century ago, Paul Ehrlich puts out a, a, a paper in Lancet which talks about the need... Okay, we don't need to do that right now, do we? <laughs> Apple, you just can't escape. Um, the dogma of hit hard and hit early was written in 1913. It was related to how you might treat syphilis. Then it became the model for tuberculosis. Give a powerful antibiotic, give it in high doses over a very short course. And therefore, what you'll do, as in, in this schematic, 
is the host, the individual being treated, are the large circles. The small green circles represent susceptible bacteria. The small red circles represent the resistant bacteria. And the dogma has been if you treat hard and fast, what you'll do is prevent the emergence of resistant bacteria. You wipe out the infection. That's the TB model. We're treating a pathogen, and we're treating a pathogen that escapes the antibiotic by mutating. It becomes resistant. So you can see here, you have a treatment failure. The tuberculosis now has emerged as being drug resistant, and now that individual can spread the disease to others. Is that relevant at all in the way we raise animals? And the answer pretty much is no. That is not how resistance to antibiotics operates today. It is irrelevant for vancomycin resistant enterococci. It is irrelevant as a model for methicillin resistant Staph aureus, the MRSA situation. Both of those organisms acquire their resistance by swapping genes between bacteria. You're not going to see resistance to methicillin and Staph aureus arise because some animal was treated with a methicillin analog and voila, we now have MRSA. That's not how it emerges. So the TB model doesn't work for most of the organisms we see in production facilities. But more important than that is that tuberculosis is an obligate pathogen. If you see it, you treat it. Is that the case with Enterococcus, Salmonella, E. coli? I mean, think about the organisms that we are being, um, what we're on the defensive about. Those organisms are not normal pathogens. They are commensals, and they just happen to be bystanders when an antibiotic is applied. So this model of hit hard and hit early may not be appropriate. The model that is appropriate looks more like this, where here you have the individuals over here with these green circles representing susceptible bacteria. The individual receives an antibiotic, which if it's at a high dose, what does it do? It destroys all of the bacteria that are susceptible. If you get treated with an antibiotic, your gut gets disrupted, right? Your doctor may tell you to take a probiotic. Why? Because your gut flora just got destroyed. Every bacterium that is susceptible to the action of that antibiotic will be attacked by that antibiotic and therefore you end up with a situation where if you take the antibiotic at high doses you destroy your normal gut flora which puts you at risk for now acquiring bugs from other people from the environment why is it a risk factor to go to the hospital and get an antibiotic is a risk factor for acquiring a multi-drug resistant pathogen because you've just put yourself at risk. You have no, no normal defenses anymore. You've destroyed your gut flora. So this model scares me because if we're going to go the route of, a, of ensuring that the only kind of use of antibiotic that is an option is a high dose short term, what we're saying is we're willing to destroy the normal gut flora of every animal that's exposed to that dose, which is going to put them at risk for both the emergence of resistance and the acquisition of resistant bacteria. And as I'm going to show throughout this talk, that is a situation that concerns me a lot more than a low dose over long term. Okay? So that's where I'm going with this. Let's think about these two competing ways we can use antibiotics. Long term low dose, short term high dose. Let's t I, I hate cherry picking the literature and finding articles that support or that I want to attack, but there are two papers that I thought by now would long be gone and yet I still find people putting these two papers up here and so I feel the need to show why these two articles in particular are totally inappropriate and provide misinformation about the antibiotic use situation we're currently discussing. The first came out in 1999 out of Denmark and talked about this multi-drug resistant Salmonella typhimurium phage type 104 that caused morbidity in people and even killed a couple people in Denmark. It was a bad bug. It was a bad bug because not only was it multi-drug resistant, it had resistance to a, a very important class of antibiotic, the fluoroquinolones. So the authors of this paper concluded that because of this increase in quinolone resistance in salmonella, the use of fluoroquinolones in food animals should be restricted. Of course, in the United States, we banned fluoroquinolones from use in poultry, and I'll get to that a little bit later. But here's the problem. It, well, there's two problems. One is, if you go deep into the paper, and you have to go deep into the paper, what do they say? There was no indication of fluoroquinolone use in those impacted, implicated herds. In fact, if there ever had been use of fluoroquinolones in those herds, I guarantee you they would have told you that. So they have absolutely no evidence that fluoroquinolones, A, caused that resistance, or B, were ever even used in those herds. 
But more importantly, fluoroquinolones are a therapy drug. They are not used for growth promotion. They are not used for disease prevention. So it is not even the type of antibiotic that we're talking about with the Pamptabil. And yet it's this article that people use to support this notion that antibiotic uses in animals are bad. Therefore, we need to ban growth promoters. A second paper came out in 2000 about a salmonella that was resistant to ceftiafur and was acquired by a child from cattle. They put in their abstract that they conclude that the study provides evidence that antibiotic resistant strains of salmonella in the U.S. are evolving primarily in livestock. To me, if I hear about a strain that's evolving resistance, that means that it's developing the resistance de novo because of the use of the antibiotic in those herds. And yet, well, let's do the same thing. Go deep into the paper and what you'll see, they were unable to establish whether ceftiafur was ever used in that herd or any herd, but what they say is that we know that ceftiafur has been approved for use in the United States. Well, you know what? Third generation cephalosporins are also used in human medicine as well in small animals. They're used everywhere. So we don't know why the resistance emerged, but it is irrelevant for the discussion of which antibiotic uses are appropriate or inappropriate. And again, ceftiafur is a therapy. It is not used for disease prevention. It is not used for growth promotion. So these two articles are not the issue, and yet that, this is the type of argument that people are making. So let's play a little game. Which antibiotic use is worse? If we're going to think about, we want to reduce the risk of the emergence of resistance and we want to promote health, should we give an antibiotic that's long-term low dose or short-term high dose? Again, the short-term high dose use is the dogma. That's the way you stop TB infections, hit hard, hit early. But if you look at many, many research studies, and again, I'm not going to cherry pick the literature, but trust me, they're there. High doses kill off your normal flora. High doses select for resistant bacteria. High doses encourage the transmission of resistant bacteria. You know what the low doses do? Nothing. They stabilize the gut flora. What we're finding through some very complex molecular type studies is that the normal gut flora is stabilized under these low dose growth promotion type doses. We still don't have a good explanation. Why do growth promoters work? It's probably because we have created a very stable gut flora for the growing animal it's not going to be subjected to changing gut environments. It's not going to be subjected to subclinical disease. We have kept the animal healthy. So this idea that we're using antibiotics on healthy animals, the answer should be, yeah, we are, and we're keeping them healthy. We don't want diseased animals, and we don't want to have to use important drugs to, uh, to um, treat sick animals. We'd rather keep them healthy in the first place. So what do we do? We can't just be defensive all the time. Well, some of us have followed what the guidelines are supposed to be. FDA has their guidance document 152, which describes exactly how to do a risk assessment for the approval or reapproval of animal drugs. And there are very specific guides that you are supposed to follow to assess what the risk to human health would be. So we did this. We did it for the macrolides, so that would be like tylosin in the feed, tomycosin, and we did it for cattle, swine, and poultry, and we followed the FDA regulations of how you conduct this type of risk assessment. And here were the estimates that we came up with for the risk to humans of a treatment failure due to a resistant infection, and that infection is resistant because of the use of the antibiotic in animals. Those risks are so low, they're basically negligible, and under any other FDA ruling, their ecological toxicology rulings, this would be reasonable certainty of no harm. But yet, we got attacked for having biased assumptions. Oh, the, it was a, um, a risk assessment commissioned by a drug company, therefore you must be biased. Well, no, FDA has asked that the drug companies do this. So who can do it then if no matter what you do, it's going to come up biased? So we've tried to play by the rules, and that doesn't necessarily seem to be working. Should we follow the Danish lead? Let's look at what Denmark said when they first decided to remove antibiotics from their animal production and what they say now. They said that back in 98 that this restrictive and selective veterinary antibiotic policy will reduce the risks for human health problems due to the use of antibiotics in animal husbandry. It was a health related issue. What did they say now in 2010? The purpose of the interventions were to reduce an observed reservoir in food animals. 
Does anybody actually know what that means? And how does that actually translate to a health impact? Well, I'll ask you. If I tell you that the issue is not about VRE or MRSA, which it is not, I just don't have time to go into all the reasons why it's not, what were the human health improvements? I couldn't come up with any, so I'm open now to suggestions. I've got two open slots here. Tell me what human health benefit was there from the ban in Denmark? So if we can't even explain clearly, or let's say if, if those who wish to ban can't explain clearly what the human health benefit is or could be, why are we going down this path? What they found in Denmark was that there was a decrease in resistance to, uh, to some antibiotics in some bacteria in the healthy human community and in the animal populations. No changes in the hospitals, no changes to human health. Like I said. And this is a figure they love to use. Look at these declines. Of course, if you read carefully, it's to uh, like macrolide resistance in Campylobacter coli. Now, how many of us are really concerned about those Campylobacter coli infections? Huge human health problem. It's ridiculous. They cherry pick their figures to decide how they're going to show you this impact. Let's go to some bugs that really are relevant. Here is Campylobacter jejuni, which is definitely an issue. Here we have the graph in broilers, and if you look over time, we're seeing an increase from Denmark in the uh, tetracycline resistance and in the naledixic acid resistance in their Danish broilers for Campylobacter jejuni. Why? Did you know that they still use fluoroquinolones in poultry in Denmark? We banned it. They allow it. They have to allow it because they banned all of the ways of keeping animals healthy, so that instead they allow you to use the highly powerful antibiotics to cure the sick animals. There's another figure. I'm more concerned about Salmonella typhimurium than I am about Campylobacter coli. And if you look, for instance, at here it is in swine, the trends for, for I mean, you name your antibiotic here. We've got tetracycline, we've got the sulfonamides, we've got the, uh, let's go through this list here, um, ampicillin. Resistance is increasing over time in Salmonella typhimurium. And this is after their ban. So again, let me ask you, what was the human health benefit? And then there's this whole fallacy of, of tonnage. How many tons of antibiotics are used in animals? And again, this is a larger discussion. I don't have time today. There are, we've written a few papers on this topic. It is a red herring. That is an irrelevant argument. Tonnage makes no sense. Instead, finally, Denmark has adopted a unit that does make sense called the average daily defined dose. And if you look at that, total antibiotic use as defined by a, a defined daily dose has been going up, not down. Why? because they're giving those high doses of important therapeutic antibiotics. What's worse, a low dose over long term or that high dose for therapy over short term that I'm saying selects for resistance? To me, this whole Danish experience makes sense to me. Resistance is increasing in the bad bugs. The antibiotic on a defined daily dose has been going up. Why do we continue to use antibiotics then in animal agriculture? <clears throat> this is a paper that we put out, it's on the next slide, it's been fairly controversial because it's been a hard study to actually do an empirical uh, confirmation on. It's right now in the phase of being a mathematical model. But from everything we see in the literature, what we know is that antibiotics seem to reduce the incidence of both clinical and subclinical disease in animals. That growth promoting antibiotic, which honestly I wish we could have changed the name, changed the way they're approved at FDA, growth promotion is so outdated as a name. Those low doses are doing so much more than just promoting growth. They are maintaining healthy animals. What do you see when you do that? You see fewer processing errors in the plant, less GI rupture, things like that. You see reduced pathogen loads on the carcass, lower salmonella loads, lower campylobacter loads. If you have fewer bacteria on the meat in the plant, don't you think that would lead to fewer foodborne illnesses? That has been, at least the first two bullet points were um, supported in a study by Russell on air sacculitis and broilers where they looked at air sac and non-air sac birds coming into the plant and what the loads of bacteria were. But we took that idea and put it into a, a mathematical model asking if you simultaneously evaluate the risks and the benefits to human health of using antibiotics in animal agriculture, AAU, it's a trade-off. Would you rather have the potential risk of increased resistance in the bacteria or would you have rather have that benefit of decreased human illness from foodborne cases. 
Well, it's, it's a simple argument in a way because you can't get sick from a resistant infection if you first don't get your foodborne illness. So it would seem that if you prevent foodborne illness, you'll also prevent resistant infections. It depends on which antibiotic you're modeling and under what situations you look at animal illness rates, but we found consistently a net benefit to human health from low doses of antibiotic in the feed. Where it becomes of concern is if you use the high doses over short term, because then you see many more resistant bugs developing, as well as many more sick animals going into the subclinically ill animals going into the processing plant. What scares me is actually this picture. This is what scares me, not that low dose use. This is a plasmid. For those of you who don't know what a plasmid is, these are accessory genetic elements within bacteria. They are easily moved from one bacterium to another. They don't even have to be related bacteria. They can swap these huge elements that contain resistance genes, virulence genes, you name it. The plasmid is a really, uh, it's a great way for bacteria to share really bad genetic information. Virulence, resistance, and if you look at this plasmid, which you can find in salmonellas, E. coli, you can find it in a whole variety of organisms. You see resistance to chlorphenicol, tetracycline, streptomycin, sulfonamides, the extended spectrum, uh, cephalosporins, aminoglycosides, mercury resistance, another sulfur resistance. There's also copper resistance on here. There's resistance to the quaternary ammonium compounds. This type of genetic structure scares me. And so my question for you is, if we go down this slippery slope of saying, we're gonna ban these low dose antibiotics which aren't even killing bacteria right they just seem to be stabilizing the good bugs in the gut what's next will we see disinfectants on the list because a disinfectant i guarantee you will select for this plasmid which means if you use a certain disinfectant in a certain way you are maintaining resistance to ceftiafir to tetracyclines chlorphenicol you name it if you're going to use copper sulfate as a disinfectant, you will again be selecting for antibiotic resistance. So when does it stop? These are the issues we really need to be thinking about. Something else that does scare me is what happens to the antibiotic once it leaves the, that animal that has ingested it? The fate of the residues does concern me. We know from surveys you can find many antibiotic residues in our water supply. Of course, Animal Ag always takes the blame for it. If you look though, if you partition out things like triclosan, which we know is a human issue, not an animal issue, and you look at the amount of triclosan used and the amount you find in the environment and you translate that to the other compounds, most of what you see in that environment is probably coming from humans dumping it down the drain, from pharmaceutical plants, etc. However, how we handle manure, how we handle all those waste issues and runoff is a huge issue and it does concern me. So we have spent some time in my lab looking at it we do in vitro experiments, and the good news for us, at least, we did it for tylosan and chlortetracycline. For tylosan and chlortetracycline, the low doses you find in river water had no effect on selecting for resistance. And those have been published, those papers. That doesn't mean that that's what's going to happen in the real world in the environment. And so th that issue of waste management does concern me, and we really need to pay attention to it. So let me wind up with a few take-home messages then, because this, I mean, this issue is huge. I can't do it justice in 20 minutes. But for me, a key is we need to figure out how to stop being defensive and stop insisting on maintaining the status quo. That's just not going to work anymore. And that's been, I think, echoed through each of the speakers today. It, but it's especially important on this antibiotic issue. So what can we do? How do we be proactive? I mean, we are still using some management strategies that haven't been reevaluated in a long time. Can we make some changes that might reduce some antibiotic uses? Weaning age. Go into your swine industry and ask, what age are you weaning at? And have you actually tested to know that that is the proper age? Could you change that weaning age? Because if you can make it a little bit older, you probably will have uh, a, a little bit less of an, an issue with, uh, with disease and the need for antibiotic. You might lose a little bit financially, but perhaps there is this trade-off, a cost-benefit way of looking at this issue. Stocking density. Is it only the economists that are deciding what the stocking density is? Is there a way for us to reduce stocking density, which would minimize the need for antibiotics, and yet still ultimately end up as a profitable um, alternative? Again, we need to be creative and be proactive and tell the public what it is we're doing to address this issue. Otherwise, all we're going to see are antibiotics disappearing. 
The one thing that may have been useful that came out of the Danish experience was their decision to, and now it's it, throughout the EU, veterinarians cannot sell antibiotics. They can prescribe, but they cannot sell. And what they have seen is that it seems for certain conditions the, that that has impacted how much antibiotic is being used. I think in this country we are going to need to look at how we dispense antibiotics through the veterinarian as well as over-the-counter distribution of antibiotics. We need to, well, this is in a way educating FDA and others about what the point of a risk assessment is. If you go back to the risk assessment that was conducted for poultry where they banned the fluoroquinolones, all it asked was, is there a risk to human health? It didn't actually look at any management options. We need to be developing better models that look at alternative solutions. We put this into our review paper that was in avian diseases, but things like if you have to treat a flock of chickens with fluoroquinolones, could you somehow separate the processing of that flock? The treated flock would go maybe at the end of the week before a total plant clean-out or something that you would re be required to do differently to reduce the risk of cross-contamination in the plant. Could you be required to clean the house and the farm more intensively? No skimming that, that litter. If you actually used fluoroquinolones, you'd have to do a full litter removal. Uh, maybe there's a minimum waiting period. It's not based on residues, it's about the risk of transferring resistant bacteria into the plant. So you use the antibiotic, you're now required to have a minimum waiting period until you process that treated flock. I mean, these may make no sense, they may not work, but the point is, we didn't even look at any management options that could have been put into place. And so I come back to this question. If you use the Danish experience as a model, as well as the literature that's out there, there is a trade-off. Which would you rather have? Chlorotetracycline, an old antibiotic that has basically very little use in human medicine, at least the tetracycline has little use in human medicine. Use that in the feed for a long time at a low dose that keeps the animals healthy in the first place, or go to a high-powered third-generation cephalosporin or a fluoroquinolone that's used in the water or by injection to treat the sick animals that then are going to get introduced into the food supply. For me, I would much prefer that first than the latter, but that doesn't seem to be the way the panther bill is going. But this is where we have to do our, our job on educating, especially the legislators, about this issue. And then as a final slide, <clears throat> I had also put in a picture of where I work in Chile, but um, there's this weird myth that somehow this antibiotic issue is tied to the family farm. If you reduce the, the amount of antibiotic that's used, we require that there's no growth promoters, etc., we're somehow going to go back to this pasture-based family farm. And that seems to be a pretty common perception, even in the public health departments that I've worked with. But if you look at the Danish example, between 95 and 05, their swine operators declined from over 25,000 to 10,000. Who survived? Only the largest, and they grew larger, and they grew more industrialized. So this issue is not about the family farm, but yet that is how it's being presented and we need to do a better job of explaining to the public especially what the impacts are going to be should we make such a drastic decision. Now I'm not saying that all antibiotic uses need to be maintained. Again, I don't think we can continue to be defensive and maintain the status quo. But we need to be proactive, hopefully led by the animal industry groups on changes that can be adopted by producers that address this issue.